The Pakistan army just has one playbook, which is to crack down. They yeah. did that in Bangladesh, we know with what results, East Pakistan did. Mm. And they did the same thing with the PTM. As the saying goes, that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this is no to smash. Welcome to the gist on Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadhar. Good evening. All was reported quiet on the uh, Iran-Pakistan border in Balochistan after last week's round of uh, drone and missile attacks by Iran and Pakistan's retaliatory shelling. Uh, not too many lives were lost, we are given to understand. And both sides appear to have cooled off after that. There have been some uh, moves towards some kind of a dialogue. So exactly what is the problem over there and... Um, I have with me Tilak Devasher, uh, former Special Secretary, uh, Cabinet Secretariat. He's also the author of a book on Balochistan that we had reviewed uh, on this show last year. Tilak, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling me. Sorry. This uh, exchange of uh, things that went on, um, is it new? Has it happened before? And uh, was it at the same scale? Uh, it's not new. It has happened in the past. Uh, there was an incident in 2013 when uh, Iran had launched missiles <clears throat> against a suspected camp of the Iranian Baloch um, in uh, Ketch, about mm -hmm. 40 or 50 miles inside Pakistan. It was again happened in 2017 uh, when they attacked uh, in Panjgor and Pakistan protested. Pakistan has shot on a couple of drones, Iranian mm -hmm. drones, but it never reached any kind of threshold. Both countries kept it below the threshold, didn't make too much of a noise for too long. For so this time, these incidents, which happened on 16th and 18th of January, are unprecedented to that extent. And because Iran went out in a fairly big way and announced it, and as did Pakistan, and then Pakistan also retaliated. So this scale of uh, attacks against each other are unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't hear very much about what goes on in uh, Iranian Balochistan, but is the level of um, dissatisfaction there with Tehran of the same level that you're seeing in uh, the Pakistani half of Balochistan? You see, in the case of the uh, Pakistani uh, half of Balochistan, the resentment and protests began almost immediately in March 1948, after mm -hmm. the forcible accession of the princely state of Kalat as Balochistan was then called. And it was the Khan's brother um, who immediately went into revolt and his insurgency lasted for about two years. That was in 1948. Then there was another insurgency in 1958, 1962, 1973, 71, uh, 77. And the current insurgency was started sometime in 2003, 2004 and has been continuing for the last uh, almost 20 years. So the scale of the insurgency has been much longer, more prolonged, and has now spread to different areas of Pakistan and Balochistan. In the case of uh, Iran, there was resentment against the Shah's regime. But it went to a different scale after the Iranian Revolution of 1979, when mm -hmm. the Shiite regime really cracked down very uh, sort of in a very harsh manner against the Sunni Baloch. And that mm -hmm. led to the creation of, uh, you know, uh, sort of pushback organizations among the Iranian Baloch. And they were initially nationalists and soon adopted a sectarian stand because of the pressure from the Sunni uh, Iranian regime. So you mean that's why Shia, you don't. Uh, sorry? You mean from the Shia Iranian regime? Yeah, the Shia Iranian regime. So we don't hear much of it because also because of the media clampdown in Iran. And it has not been so long-lasting as the Pakistani uh, Baloch insurgency. But it is certainly there. There's a lot of resentment among the Iranian Baloch as much as there is amongst the Pakistani Baloch. So Sistan has always been a part of Iran for, um, I mean, uh, was the Balochistan ever united? Yeah. You see, now, this is the interesting thing, which, again, the British are responsible. <laughs> Wherever they have gone, they're partitioned, you know. Yeah. So... The first 
sort of Kalat Confederacy, you know, the Baloch Confederacy goes back to the uh, 12th century, then 15th century. But the first Kalat uh, Confederacy was in the 17th century. And the 18th mm-hmm. century systems of governance started happening. Initially, Kalat was under the uh, what do you call control of first Persia, Nadir Shah, and then the Afghanistan, Amin Shah Durrani. But then the Khan of Kalat broke away and became independent till the time the British came. After the British had taken control, they partitioned uh, Baluchistan for the sake of the great game. They wanted, didn't want Russia coming in towards India so as to appease Iran about almost more than one fourth of the territory of Kalat was partitioned and handed over to Persia by called the Goldsmith Line. You have know, the Durand mm-hmm. Line on the other uh, frontier, and here you have the Goldsmith Line. So one fourth of it went in 1871. There were further adjustments in about the 1890s and early 1900s when additional portions were given to Persia and small portions were also given to Afghanistan. So okay. Alat really became truncated. And that's why you have a problem of the Baloch in uh, Iran. Otherwise, they were all part of uh, Kalat, the Prince of Kalat. Mm-hmm. So do they cooperate, the Baloch Liberation Army, Baloch Liberation Front, and whatever groups there are in uh, Sistan? You see, at one time, the agenda of the Baloch uh, groups in Pakistan was Greater Balochistan, which incorporated parts of Iran and parts of Afghanistan. But that has sort of underplayed. So they don't talk about a Greater Balochistan anymore. So yes, they may seek help or sanctuary, but there is not much of an interaction in terms of a, a Greater Balochistan movement. That sort of died out some time ago. Therefore, you'll find that Iran is not really worried about separatism of the Baloch from Pakistan, just as Pakistan is not really concerned about nationalism from the Iranian Baloch because they have gone the sectarian way rather than the nationalist way. Mm-hmm. What about in Afghanistan? Is there any Baloch sentiment there? You see, it's very limited. There are pockets of Baloch in uh, Helmand, in Nimroz, in Farah, and in Kandahar, but they are about 200, 250,000. Not mm-hmm. a strong mass. And besides, they are also Sunni, just like the Pashtuns in these areas are. So there is no okay. persecution of Baloch as Baloch. So they mm-hmm. don't have an issue. In fact, at one time, there were people in Afghanistan who said that these were the territories of Ahmed Shah Durrani. So they had talked about a greater Afghanistan, incorporating Balochistan with Afghanistan. You know, I see. so at one time you had a, uh, you know, uh, the Baloch talking about greater Balochistan, and then you had some Afghans talking about a greater Afghanistan. No, these are all ancient lands, and because they were partitioned by the British for their sort of great game, they have left behind a lot of unsettled issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would you say the issues in uh, Pakistani Balochistan are in that sense live and more um, demand immediate kind of attention? Yes, I think so. You see, because the, the Baloch did not accept the forcible accession of Kalat and they broke out in insurgency straight away. Mm-hmm. And there have been, whenever the Baloch have felt strong enough, they have broken out into insurgency. Charlie, Pakistan, they look, we don't accept merger or a situation in Pakistan. So first was the forcible accession. Then the way Pakistan or the Punjabi elements in the, uh, Pakistan have treated Balochistan as a colony, whether it is social economic development, whether it is a political empowerment, now these Chinese projects. So the Baloch feel they've been pushed to the wall, that they are now going to become marginalized in their own state. They'll become a minority with the influx mm-hmm. of Chinese the influx of Punjabis and other people, they are going to become a minority in their own province. So they feel that the only way out is separatism. You see, the Baloch movement is divided into two broad groups. One are the armed Baloch groups who feel that there is no point talking to the Pakistan government. They have tried it in the past. There is mm-hmm. no point talking to them anymore because their demands are not going to be conceded politically by the Pakistan government. The second group are the Baloch politicians who believe that it is still possible to get their uh, you know their rights within the political framework of pakistan so they participate in elections they are represented in quetta they have some seats in the national assembly but now what is the interesting thing that has happened is that a third element has come to the fore which is civil society mm-hmm. you know for the last almost two months there was this long march from turbat 
then to Quetta and now in Islamabad. It's been 15 days or so in Islamabad, protesting against enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. You know, Baluchistan have been the worst sufferers because the uh, security forces have total impunity. They just go and pick up somebody, they torture him. You know, people have been missing for the last 18 years, last 14 years. A woman was saying she doesn't know whether she's a widow or her husband is still alive. Mm-hmm. Girls as young, you know, 12, 13 year old girls have been protesting for the last 15 years because they don't know whether their fathers or brothers are alive. This lady who's come to the fore, a doctor, she's a medical doctor, Marang yeah. Baloch. She has been on the streets since the age of 13. And she is very articulate, very uh, sort of uh, determined, very tough and brave. And she says that, you know, they can't scare us. If your family members have been missing for the last 14 years, yeah. what more are you to scare us with? And this has got the imagination of the world because the first time ever, the Baloch women who are you know, very conservative have now come to the streets because their menfolk are missing. And they yeah. are leading it. And now this has led to protests all over uh, Balochistan and gradually in other parts in Karachi, in the Baloch areas of Punjab and things like that. The Pashtuns are supporting them too because Pashtuns also have this uh, Pashtun Tarafas movement, which is also a yeah. civil society movement protesting yeah. against they're being treated as cannon fodder for terrorism and for Pakistan's foreign policy objectives. So this is a new element in the Baloch movement, that you now have an emerging civil society movement, which is difficult. See, the Pakistan army just has one playbook, which is to crack down. They did that in Bangladesh, we know with what results, East Pakistan then. Mm. And they're doing the same thing with the PTM. As the saying goes, that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this is no to smash. They mm. can't deal with a civil society movement. They don't know what to do. You know, they say, I mean, how come? You know, uh, what what do you do with this? Because their tactic is, uh, you know, uh, to pick up people, kill them, or shoot them, or whatever. They can't mm. do this because it's being led by women. And the international attention is now focused on this. Several countries are talking about it. The UN is talking about it. So they are finding it very difficult. So they try and disrupt it. They don't allow blankets. You know, they are uh, protesting outside the press club and bitterly cold in Islamabad. Mm-hmm. So uh, they don't allow them heating. They don't allow them food to come in at times. They take away their speakers and sound systems. So this is an important element in the whole Baloch movement. And we need to see how it uh, how it sort of develops. If it ties up with the Pashtuns, PTM in a stronger and they both start protesting jointly, mm-hmm. it could become problematic for Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Does it resonate outside? You know, like the Tibetans, they've been around for a long time. The Chinese occupation is old. Everybody knows about it. But somehow, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't lead to some, you know. Yeah. The reason is, you know, the, the Baloch have 44% of Pakistan's land area, but just mm-hmm. about 4 to 5% of the population. So they are not a critical mass. Mm-hmm. The diaspora, Baloch diaspora is there but not in such large numbers. So they do protest in London, they do protest in the US, in Germany, they come to Geneva. Gradually, it is resonating. You know, there was a, for example, in the British Parliament, one of the MPs put forward an early day motion. I think the uh, Irish Parliament, the European Union has taken note of it. And they have warned Pakistan that GSP plus is dependent on uh, human rights, respect for human rights, and uh, the stopping this extrajudicial killings. Um, you know, the climate activist Rita Thunberg has uh, tweeted in their favor. So gradually they are attracting international attention. It's not to the same extent, certainly nowhere near what the Tibetans' uh, cause is. But, you know, because they're starting, uh, and Pakistan has clamped a lid on media reportage from Baluchistan. Mm-hmm. It's only able to get out. Earlier also, there were long marches. There was a Mama Kadir who left a long march in 2014, but it didn't get that kind of resonance as it has got now, primarily because of the women being in front and being very tough and not not being scared. Mm -hmm. So I think it will resonate uh, abroad also as people become more and more aware of what Pakistan has been doing over the decades uh, in Balochistan. Assuming that there is a kind of an alliance between the uh, Baloch and the Pashtun, um, that makes for a huge uh, uh, block, you know, against the uh, authorities in Islamabad. 
Uh, you think Absolutely. the military, then all gloves are off as far as the army is concerned? You see, the gloves will be off because the TTP, the, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, also established linkages with some Baloch armed groups. So they are sharing resources. They, they've got territory, mm -hmm. you know, uh, space in Baluchistan, and the Baloch are getting advanced weapons, which the Americans had left behind in uh, Afghanistan. But on the civil society, so the army can tackle that. They can go after them in, uh, you know, intelligence operations or uh, shoot their way out of it. But where civil society movements are concerned, where the PTM and the uh, what's called the Baloch Jagjati Council, yeah. who's leading the uh, protest committee, I think Baloch Jagjati Committee, if they were to join hand and stage joint demonstration, Pakistan army will try and disrupt it, arrest the leaders, not allow the march to uh, proceed. But I think the judiciary plays an important role. And there are some people from Punjab also who are saying, why are you doing this? Then mm -hmm. Pakistan army will find it very difficult uh, to uh, you know, have a sustained crackdown. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a human rights issue. Human rights issues are something you just can't. And people know that you know the army has picked up people and their tortured bodies end up dead after a couple mm -hmm. of months or after a couple of years. So yeah. that is something which is totally unpalatable to the you know the civilized world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should you hear know, these, uh, sorry, you should hear these people talk. You know, the thanks to social media, they are alive. Uh, their activities are alive because of the social media. Though there is a media clampdown, uh, um, but you know, media is coming out. Newspapers are coming out, and very sort of brave Pakistani journalists take their interviews mm -hmm. for YouTube and for their own channels. So again, you know. Sensitization is taking place even in Pakistan. And that's mm -hmm. how the army is finding it difficult to control. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Tilak, more than a decade ago, perhaps during um, the younger George Bush's time, when the neocons were around in the US, there was a map brought out by, I think, the US Ralph Army Peters. magazine, which Ralph saw Peters. Pakistan, a lot of other places as um, uh, independent ent entities, you know. You think somewhere up there in the US, these kind of ideas still hold true? It's very difficult to say what is the kind of uh, support this has in the US permanent establishment. There'll be people you know, who can uh, float ideas and things. But what is the, the permanent establishment? I think Balochistan for them would be a low priority because mm. the greater priority has always been Pakistan. You know, okay. unified Pakistan who's helped them against the Soviet Union, helped them in the war of terror help them against Russia. So they would not like the British. You see, at one time, the British had encouraged the independence of Kalat. But once they realized that Pakistan can serve their cause much better, in fact, the Imperial uh, Chiefs of Staff came out with the formulation that in the whole of the subcontinent, Pakistan is a strategic territory which would serve British interests. Mm -hmm. Once that was laid down policy, the, there was a telegram from uh, London to the British High Commissioner in Karachi that tell Jinnah not to accept Kalat's independence. That's when Jinnah also mm -hmm. changed his mind and then he forced the accession. Similarly, you know, in Gilgit, a similar kind of a thing. There was one time where the governor Olaf Caro, he even suggested that Britain should hold on to a sliver of territory in NWFP and Balochistan for the sake of their own interests. So they were looking for their, uh, you know, uh, their interests. So I'm yeah. sure the US will follow a similar kind of uh, practice that, you know, Pakistan can serve their interests much better than, let's say, a Balochistan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> in, 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 in fact, uh, you know, the first time uh, the late Henry Kissinger visited uh, Pakistan was somewhere in the 60s and the 62 uh, insurgency was going on. And somebody asked him this question, that what do you think of the insurgency in Balochistan? He said, I won't know anything about the Baloch insurgency, even if it hit me in the face. So I've quoted this in my Balochistan book. And mm -hmm. when he was here in mm -hmm. Delhi uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago, I showed him the reference in my book. And he said, yes, I remember. He said, I almost got tracked by my mm -hmm. university for having made that comment. So, you know, Balochistan doesn't resonate. A couple of people, mm -hmm. uh, excellent American authors, have written about Balochistan, but it does not really resonate in the... Uh, permanent uh, U.S. establishment, or even among think tanks. Mm -hmm. It's not a critical mass as yet. Mm -hmm. 
So I come to my last question. We looked at how the Americans see this. What about us? What are we doing there, or what are we not doing? You know, if we just look at the map, we we, we don't share any uh, a land access. border. Yeah. yeah, we don't share any access. So, and it, it's an international. You know, we follow go by the book as far as international relations are concerned. So there's very little that we can uh, do, but. That's as far the government is concerned. But I always tell people who ask this question that as concerned citizens of the neighborhood, there's no reason why individuals, you know, cannot follow Baloch groups, individuals, tweet or retweet whatever they are saying on social media. I think Indians yeah. need to be far more active on social media where issues of human rights are concerned. If anything happens in India, you'll find that the Pakistani will come down to you like a ton of, a ton of bricks. Yeah. You know? Mm. Uh, poor some cricketer dropped a catch, and everybody got after him that you know he was, uh, uh, you know, in all kinds of. Uh, mm. We don't have, we don't, we lack that kind of uh, empathy and that kind mm. of seriousness. So we should take up uh, the Baloch cause, individuals. Why the government? The government will do what it has to do as per international norms, but the yeah. people of India should certainly and through your medium, you know, follow Baloch group, follow Pashtun groups. Articulate their issues whenever there are human rights violations. Why not? Well, let's hope things change, Tilak. Um, thanks very much for that perspective. Um, I know a lot about this, about uh, Balochistan and the, of course, the Iranian part. Perhaps the subject for your next book, you know. Uh, yeah, please, Tilak, that's all we have. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, Tilak, thanks very much. Uh, good talking to you. And thank you for having me. This... Oh, yeah, lovely. Thank you for having me. And all the Great best. to have you. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's all we have for you now on this edition of The Gist. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Thank you very much. Good night.